Um, so today I have the great pleasure of inv um, inviting and uh, um, introducing my colleague, Marcel Fortin. Uh, Marcel is the head of the Math and Data Library at the University of Toronto. He and his team support geospatial research and teaching across all three campuses of Canada's largest post-secondary institution. Marcel also teaches the course The Power of Maps and, Maps and Geographic Information in the Geography Department at the University of Toronto. In 2014, Marcel co-edited the book um, Historical GIS Research in Canada, published by the University of Calgary Press. Marcel was the principal investigator on a two-year federal government research grant to develop a Canadian historical GIS network. One of the grant's main goals is to develop HGIS and spatial history standards to increase interoperability, discoverability, and use between the multitude of HGIS and geohumanities projects across numerous disciplines and institutions in Canada. Um, I think that today also Marcel is going to touch on, upon things that um, uh, in the theme of our libraries, libraries and librarians working as partners with faculty members uh, in digital humanities projects. So I welcome Marcel. Uh, thank you very much for having me speak to you today. And Fabiano uh, um, initially asked me to talk about one specific project, but then I thought I talk a lot about specific projects and the ins and outs of them, and then we don't really talk about our projects and what how meaningful they are, or, or perhaps they they're not. But in some ways, how digital projects can actually make an impact. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about that, not necessarily about how my project made an impact, because I think. Part of being in the library world is that we're, we're there to provide material that can have impact, but we're not necessarily the ones that provide that impact. So uh, with that, let me start with, um, I work in a map and data library, <laughs> and the, the, the number one thing that I hear people tell me when I tell them I work in a map and data library is they say, I love maps. And it's always been a, a, a bizarre kind of comment to me because, um, of course, there, there's something pleasing about maps, absolutely. Uh, and thinking about it more and more, I started realizing the reason it bothers me is sort of maps are so complex that how can you actually love all maps? Just like you, you wouldn't necessarily love a page of a book. You wouldn't say I love a page of a book. Well, a book is a full, often a full story in its own, but one map is rarely a full story. And I think that's the crux of what I want to talk about is how maps can be used in digital projects, but one map isn't a digital project. So. Um, so that, that, that's sort of the crux of, of what I want to talk about today. So maps are defined in many different ways. The International Cartographic Association has sort of led its way, ha, has led the way in, in sort of defining in, in their own definition of maps. And they've actually changed it many, many times over the years. And it's also a very weird thing to actually try and define. How, who, and, and who decides what a map is and, and how you define it. And if you think of a book again, nobody goes out there and says, well, this is the definition of a book. But we do that with maps because maps are a little more complex, right? We don't necessarily know exactly what they do and how they do it sometimes. Uh, there's more to a map than just its surface. So maps are defined, like I said, in many different ways by many different people. And uh, some of the, the, the scholars I'm just going to cite now uh, sort of inch their way towards De different definitions. So Skelton writes that maps provide information which no other docu kind of document can do so efficiently. Um, and, and you often see that maps are, are, are defined as basic, vital human communication. They're also uh, seen as symbols for transmitting, transmitting our environment, transmitting that knowledge. It's a graphic representation of our spatial understanding of our world. It's that it, it, it's often an, an analogy for physical space. And th this one is, a, I think, the, the best one because it's very open, but at the same time, it, it, says, it, it lends itself to how we actually use map. We, we use codes. The map is full of codes, and we put our own codes into reading the map, and we decode those. And then when we re recreate new maps, or even maps in our minds, we code and recode all the time, and that's that's how I see maps. Is is parts of codes, and that, that's why maybe this is I don't necessarily say I love maps. <laughs> and of course, maps—it's no secret—are partially art, and 
just like with art, there's more than meets the eye more, most of the time. And this is my favorite uh, uh, definition of maps, is that they are slippery customers. And maps can play you for a fool. Um, because maps can be pretty and they can be a stimulus, uh, but always the map, the wise map user is a skeptic because all maps lie and all maps exaggerate and all maps omit things. You don't have a choice. And what that leads us to is this, the, I think it leads us to, and especially in our, in our world now, we think of, well, if, if you know maps and the definition of maps, there's a very concrete world out there, well then you, you're either literate or illiterate when it comes to geography. And I think this, this, this is, is a bit of a, a problem and I think this is where doing digital work can actually lend itself to, uh, to helping us in terms of defining what geoliteracy is and um, understanding our world better. And if you're not a fan of Cheers, maybe you're a fan of former um, President of the United States who said dumb things. <laughs> so this is Ronald Reagan toasting uh, in Brazil to the people of Bolivia. Um, but this idea of ge geoliteracy, um, in Canada and, and in the United States, you see these kinds of surveys all the time. This is 1988 that said in, one in seven Canadian adults can't find Canada on a world map, according to a Gallup poll. In 2005, the Canadian Sub Council for Geographic Education said that one in three Canadians are geographically illiterate. Now, if you look at some of the ways they get at these numbers, this is, for instance, the Great Canadian Geography Challenge. Have a look at what some of these questions are. What is it called when the low pressure and strong winds raise water levels one meter? Well, I don't know. And I work in maps all the time, and does that mean I'm geoliterate? Or this is uh, the Canadian Geographic, sort of our equivalent of National Geographic in Canada, that uh, asks such things as, which three rivers are these? There are, there are millions of rivers in Canada, and they ask us this. And the hint is that they're to scale. <laughs> and one, one example that always struck me is when people know countries and don't know countries. And the world's youngest country is South Sudan gained its independence in 2011. But, you know, I learned other African maps. My parents learned different African maps. Things change a lot over time. Does that mean that I'm illiterate if I don't know that that's South Sudan? Or that you're illiterate if you didn't know that South Sudan wasn't a country before? So which is it? Whose literacy are we talking about? Now this is Lily, and she's very good at pointing places out in the world. This is our daughter, Lily. She's almost two years old. And she wants to show you how she's really good with the map. Notice that he says the hey, map. Lily. <laughs> hey, Lily. Where is Brazil? Oh, yeah, there it is. Where's the USA? There it is. Where is Russia? Russia. Where's Russia? Russia. Where's Russia? So she goes on and, and, and does several countries like this. Um, in, in the same vein, this is a best-selling book by, uh, no surprise, a Jeopardy master who knew also where all the countries of the world were. And the book flap reads that now that technology and geographic illiteracy are increasingly insulating us from the lay of the land around us, we're going to be needing these people more than ever. Now this amounts to me as to trivia, and I don't know how trivia is going to help us understand our world. And this is a, a professor at uh, Memorial University in Newfoundland. And in 2013, she made the, the news because she, wrote, she, she was interviewed saying that students can't identify the different continents of the world. And um, she says there's a very simple solution, and that is that you just need to buy a cheap map. Don't pay more than a dollar for it, and eat your breakfast cereal on it, and then everything will be fine. And I thought, is that the same thing about sociology, then? Do you just need just any old sociology book? Maps are more complex than just buying a cheap map, right? But then, what of, of Google and GPS? That, those were supposed to be our new geographic literacy tools. Um, 
things were supposed to be better. Mil billion, uh, more than a billion people, I've stopped counting, in 2011, over, uh, there were over a billion downloads of Google Earth. GPS is more and more accurate, and yet we still see stories like these where people have gone wrong with GPS or have misinterpreted uh, Google Maps and then blamed Google Maps. Um, so there still needs to be a critical, uh, a critical part to using geographic information. And when you think about Google Maps, sure, it's a great tool to guide you. Uh, but is it a, a, a geographic literacy tool? I really doubt it. Really, what they're doing is selling us things, right? Well, showing us how to get there. Um, so just a, a typical zoom into Manhattan, for instance, the very first things that you see are not hospitals or soup kitchens, right? You see commercial enterprises. If you want to see a soup kitchen, you actually have to search for it, and then it might, they might show up. Or same thing with hospitals. The closer you zoom in without asking for soup kitchens, they won't show up. So. Geographic literacy tool, not so much, I don't think. So what's at stake then with, with geographic literacy and, and, and the way we use maps? And cognitive mapping, I think, is, is, is where we, we have to think about how people use maps. It's, cognitive mapping is the inner space uh, in, our, in our heads, right? It's the environment in our heads. It's how we collect uh, and organize and store and recall and manipulate our spatial information. Uh, and the way we view and use maps can actually affect that back in, in, in the way we interpret the world. It, does, it, it makes sense. You see it in one way, you don't see the entire Earth at once all the time. So that, it affects how you see that. And the danger is that, the map, is that, um, that seeing the world in a certain way, and only one way, Google, let's say, can actually lead to things like little kids thinking, and, and it's normal that if, a, if, a, if there's a plane on a map, it probably means there's a plane there, not an airport. So th that's an extreme case, but it, 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 th there are subtleties in our maps that make it so that we actually have to think about what it is uh, that we're looking at. Um, and this is called cartographic realism. It's the belief that the, the, the map is the real world and that the that maps portray things as they really are and that maps are not necessarily selective or or, uh, or subjective. So an extreme example of this is uh, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn in the flying boat journey over the USA uh, in Tom Sawyer Abroad, where Huck says that he knows by the color that they're right, they're flying over Illinois. And Tom asks him, what does the color have to do with it? It's got everything to do with it, Huck says. Illinois is green, Indiana is pink. I've seen it on the map, and it's pink. <laughs> now that's an extreme case, and it's, of course, literature. But in a more serious way, the argument about cartographic realism was taken up in the 1980s and, and continues to this day by Arno Peters, a German historian and cartographer who suggested that the most, um, most of our classroom maps were designed and created, uh, amount, they amounted to an unfair view of equatorial areas of the world, namely that African countries were made to look smaller than they really were, uh, and that this propagated a superior view of the Western world. Um, and so this is a Mercator map, the map that, that, uh, that uh, Peters attacked, saying that the, uh, for instance, uh, the northern parts of the world, like Greenland, uh, are made to much, look much bigger. And of course, uh, Greenland is 14 times smaller than Africa, and so he has a case, except the, the Mercator projection was never supposed to be used this way. So his projection looked like this. So it, while the Mercator projection is true to form, uh, it's not true to size. And the Peters projection is true to size, but it's not true to form. So it distorts what the world looks like. So either way, I think you're still distorting the world, and, not, and there's not one better than the other. But if you look at both of them together, then you're looking at the world in different ways. I think your, your mind thinks differently. And then when you start thinking about things historically, um, you know, maps work, work at, at capturing and influencing uh, how we see the world, and, and the nature of, the, of maps is to influence us. And like photos, maps capture a moment in time. And that's why geography and history are so closely related, right? Uh, we look at geography over time. But both also capture an interpretation of the moment, uh, not an actual reflection of the moment. And once a map is accepted, though, it becomes fact and scientific. And that's how we work. 
Um, and so in, in a Spanish voyage in 1533 sparked a myth that California was an actual island separate from North America. And it remained so, and it remained so on many, many maps. Um, despite contradictory reports uh, from explorers and uh, of the region. And California to, to continued to be depicted until 1747 as separate from the continent, uh, when King Ferdinand of Spain was forced to issue a decree that California was not an island. So that's over 200 years worth of maps, even though people, most people did know that, that uh, it was not an island. What, what labels we also put on maps sticks with us. What we call things is important, and maps are a vehicle for these names. So you take this, the Waldsmuller map from 1507. It was the first map to show uh, South America with the name America on it. And it was named after Marco Vespucci on, on this map. And there's a little photo of him there. And he was no explorer. He was more of a reporter of the time. And, and because of his writings, became a, a synonymous with the continent. His name was put on the map eventually taken off of this map, but it had been done already. Not the damage, but, um, but the importance of this map is, is crucial as well, right? The United States government paid $10 million to buy it, as sort of the United States birth certificate, in a sense. So that's a, a big case, but what happens in a closer-to-home case uh, like this one? This is a, a lake in uh, northern Quebec. This is a 1956 map that we have here at the Map and Data Library. And the 1976 version, you'll see that the lake is actually gone. And then the latest version, there is no map, first of all. We only get data for it. And this is what you get. And so most people would just download this version. This is all they would get. And there's no law in Canada that any of these need to be preserved. So when you think of the preservation of, of this information, this is what people would get. And the metadata actually say that the, the, the data can be between 1974 and 2000, and that's the data we've got. So think of this historically impossible to, unless you actually look at all three, which is really very difficult to do unless you're at a university that has kept all three that has the, 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 the wherewithal to do that. So maps also, also depict people on the land in many different ways, and, and so if you take native populations of northern Ontario, they've been mapped since the 17th century, this is a 1641 map of Northern Ontario, and you can see that this lake actually says this is the home of the Nipissings. This is where the Nipissings live. And then in the 1750s, in a very, in a very small map, like a uh, small scale map like this, again, land of the Nipissings. In the 1850s, you can see the reserve is there. In the 1880s, the reserve is there. In the 1980s, the reserve is there on the federal government topographic map. But then all of a sudden, what happens in 2016? Even if you search for that reserve, you won't find it. You'll get this green park on Google Maps, but you won't get a wording anywhere that says that that's a reserve. Google Ma Apple Maps, same thing. Uh, Open Street Map, same thing. Um, so that's that. That's a cartographic omission. But sometimes there's also controversies, right? We've also seen many controversies. But did you know that you can actually look at Google Maps India and Google Maps North America and Google Maps? Korea or wherever, and you'll see differences in these, but we never really do that, do we? And you can't overlay one on top of the other to see that in Google Maps India, the uh, Google Maps India, there is no border between Kashmir and uh, and China because it is part of of India. And in Google Maps North America, you can see that they're sort of straddling the line and have an actual uh, tempted border. And of course. Uh, Google Maps Korea, Google Maps Japan, and Google Maps Canada all have a different name for this island that we won't discuss too much about. <laughs> so it's more than knowing what's, uh, what's a map or what's on a map. It's about it's how, how the map works, what its power is, what it's telling you, and what isn't it telling you. Uh, J.B. Harley and David Woodward, two academics uh, in, of cartography, revolu revolutionized only about 30 years ago how we should approach the quest for understanding maps and in two articles called Deconstructing the Map and Why Cartography Needs Its History. And that really, really struck me, is that, that aspect of understanding maps through history. It's crucial. And um, Jerry Broughton, who wrote uh, The History of the World in 12 Maps, wrote that we should take the, le or let's take the long historical perspective. And I think that's important. 
we need to we need to see uh, we need need to be able to put, to put all maps within their historical context. Even Google Maps, even as they they spit out thousands of them every day or millions of them every day, we need to put them in their context. And they argued that we need to avoid the pageantry of maps, sort of sort of this view that that you you, you show maps very very many of them in a row as so as though they they're an evolution. But they're a reflection of these times, rather, and we shouldn't see them as plugging in holes in different places, which is unfortunately something that we, see, we still see to this day. Um, this is an article about a, a book I just read um, where this fellow went to northern Ontario and discovered new uh, waterfalls, and he describes it about changing the map. And it's this concept that there's only one map out there, right? It's the one of discovery. It's the one of cover the earth and then you're done. You put, put aside everything else. And that, that, I think that that's, that, that, that that's not a healthy thing to do. And, and I'm, I'm, I was really impressed with David Rumsey, who has recently d donated his, his collection to Stanford University, who was the first one really to put out there free maps, digital maps, saying use these, use these. and I remember starting out our digital collections and thinking, oh, maybe we could make money for this from these. And then, no, this, this is how libraries think, right? And I remember seeing David Rumsey saying, if you put things on the web for free, good things happen. And it sort of struck me right away. And, um, and then when you consider the, 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 what I think is the demand for geographic information, there's a demand for history, there's a demand for, for maps. Um, and then when you think of the history of digital mapping as well, the 1960s, this is something that was difficult to, to gain access to. Um, but it was something that the government needed for land management. Uh, it, was, it was clear that there was a demand for this geographic information. Demand for data grew as well, and libraries became involved in that, this aspect as well, Ma both paper maps and in data uh, in, with the federal government in Canada. And of course, everything changed in the mid-2000s with Google Maps coming along. But all of, all of a sudden, though, it became the demystification of maps in a lot of ways. The, the entry to people asking, what can be mapped? What else can be mapped? And this concept of free can be done. You can do things for free. You can put your maps online for free and, and, and your data online for free. And so when you think of, of GIS, it's again the same concept. The, or Google Maps, you, 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 it's the same concept that people wanted this and Google came along and realized there's a profit to be made with this as well, but there is that, that, that need from society. So we, we have put a lot of maps online um, and slowly it, it, gained, it came to me though that there's more to just putting maps online. What else can you do with them? The, the, these are static images. What else can we do with them? And again, I was doing maps and I was doing GIS and it dawned on me that you could, do, you could combine those two. And, and historical GIS is something that, that, that's brewing, uh, that's still you know, uh, uh, taking on steam. Um, and so GIS, if you're not familiar with it it, it, it takes data and allows you to map it out, but it also allows you to analyze it. And it allows you to overlay information. And that's a crucial part of it. You overlay layer upon layer upon layer of information. And to the point where you can, of course, add imagery and you can then add historical imagery. And you start seeing things like this, where what was there before? There was an actual park, uh, there, was an, uh, there were actual buildings where this park uh, is now. And you can overlay the two on, together like that. So GIS and Google allow you to ask what was there a lot more efficiently and, and in more insightful ways. You can have a look at all these images, but if you can combine them together, even better. You can actually analyze them much more. And we're seeing what was there in a lot of other ways as well. Even Google Street View has historical imagery. Um, the, the, these are crowdsourcing projects where uh, people have, uh, uh, British Library and New York Public Library have put up maps so that people can actually um, overlay on top of, of Google Maps. Uh, there's this one here that is actually called What Was Here and allows you to overlay uh, historical imagery on top of Google Street View. Even Google uh, Earth has, has uh, historical imagery that you can overlay like this, but you can't overlay, you can actually just view. 
And this is where I think the difference is, is that in, you can view in Google, but you can't necessarily overlay very easily. So if you take our example of our disappeared lake here again, so our, our disappeared lake over here is the marsh here, and you can actually overlay the two on top of the other, the two maps plus the current data. You bring all these th together. Um, and here's the outline of me having digitized where the lake was. So now you can actually have a, a, a clearer perspective. So I know I went a long time into uh, to preparing why historical GIS is important. And now I want to talk a little bit about a specific historical GIS project. There are many, many that I'm involved with right now. But this one is really the one that really showed me what people want, uh, how the importance of, of building these kinds of projects. So we built a historical GIS of industry inside the green area here, the watershed, the, the, the Don River watershed. Um, and what we did is we took mostly historical maps of uh, fire insurance plans especially and digitized them. And you can see the, the, the incredible detail that it's on here. And we georeferenced them. So that means bringing them into a GIS and overlaying them like this, and, and mosaicing them, and then from that, building a database of industry. And so you can see, we built point layers because polygons would have taken way too long, and we categorized all of these uh, by different types of, <coughs> of industry. Um, now, I could go into uh, more detail of some of the problems here, but uh, I'll leave that to, for now. Um, we used also uh, city directories that helped us pinpoint certain addresses because in the maps they would uh, industry would appear and then disappear. Uh, so using different sources uh, was really useful. And this was what uh, we came up with in terms of the final product. It wasn't a huge, huge project, but I think it was really uh, it, it, it was it was a useful tool in the end. Uh, and it actually came out of a reference uh, uh, reference interview with a PhD student who wanted to overlay these maps, but she was doing it with photocopies. And instead, I said, why don't we just scan them all and bring them into a GIS? And it became, as Fabiano mentioned, a, a book later on, a few years later, we actually ended up publishing a book based on the entire thing. Um, and so this is industry as it evolves from 1825 to 1852. And you can start seeing the, the lower dawn being uh, uh, populated with um, industry. And you can see that in the lower parts of the dawn, it, right on the lakeshore, there's no industry there. And that's because the land was recaptured. That, that was actually still the lake or marshland in that particular case. And so that made me think, well, we can't just do industry. We'll actually have to do, and here you can see industry going onto that area, is that when this land was claimed, industry went on onto the to that land um, and so it made me think we need to also do the hydrography we need to do the historical shoreline so bringing it into a GIS also allows you to do things like querying it so on a, on a static map that's one thing it's beautiful to see on a map but when you compile compile compiled years and years of data and want only one specific industry without having to look all over where is this specific industry you can actually query it and or symbolize it based on just the just the information that you want. So in this case, boundaries in 1911 and 1935, oil and gas between 1911 and 1951. So it allows you to do a lot of really interesting things. Um, I'm going to skip over the polygon part of this. Um, and so I mentioned water. We have a fascination in Toronto with water, and the reason is. There's water everywhere. Basements flood all the time because we've buried tons of rivers here, as we, as a lot of, a lot of cities in North America have. So there's a fascination with uh, hydrography. So we built many years worth of, and you can see this is the dawn now. It's very straight, but it was actually very, very uh, windy initially. So you can see here. Zoom in. And the, this is the marshland that eventually became home to huge industry uh, in the early 20th century. So this is the shoreline in 1857, 91, 94, 1909, 1918, and this is all of them together. And in some places it's over uh, two kilometers away from the original shoreline. 
uh, where our fern shoreline is. And so uh, here's a, a quick look at some of the hydrography we've done. This is part of the initial project, but there's such a demand, we've actually built more. We've built more of these uh, hy uh, historical hydrography. And we're working with an actual group uh, called the Lost Rivers. Um, they want more data because they actually have walks. They do walks to educate people about water in the city, and they used our data. And then we use their data on top of it as well, because we can use it in, in our reference work and in our uh, online work as well. So that's, that's been one of the huge eye-openers, is that as soon as we put up our data, people downloaded it. People were using it. Um, this is the initial uh, cartography that they had on their website back in the, in the 1990s and their uh, map maker unfortunately passed away and so they were left with no way of actually mapping and so we took a lot of their information and, and mapped it out. Very simple website, still uses, still provides lots of downloads in um, both uh, GIS format and Google Earth format. Um, some of the challenges is, again, thinking historically. The, the first thing that geographers tend to say when I say to them, this is a map from 1857 on the left and 1858 on the right, and they both depict the river in, in different ways. Well, how can you do that? You'll have to pick the most accurate one. Well, it's pretty much impossible to decide which one is the most accurate. They're obviously different. And so we had to think about these differently. I've had to think about maps differently. And so the way we portray our data is we don't say that that's the river in 1857 and that's the river in 1858, but that's the river as it was depicted on a map in 1857. It's sort of a, a, a bit of a cop-out, but at the same time, when you understand what I, what I try to explain to people as to how maps work and how they, what they say, I think it does make sense. At least it makes sense to me for, in my own head right now, in my cognitive space. <laughs> So compiling all this information also takes a bit of thinking. Building, there, there are no real guidelines for historical GIS, and that's one of the things that I'm working on as well right now, is sort of how, uh, helping people. I don't want to have strict guides on exactly how to do it, because that sort of stifles uh, creativity. Um, but uh, compiling that information has been difficult. And so again, it's this concept as of, this is not data for that specific year. It's data built on maps for that year. Because you'll have to remember, a map isn't a, a snapshot of a year. It's a snapshot of compilations of years, right? Most of the time. Maps compile information, as I showed you. They're time catchers. So you can't think of a map as being published in 1988, that all the data on it will be 1988. So that, that takes some getting used to for, uh, for geographers and historians as well. Sometimes you map out things that you think afterwards, yeah, that was hard and that wasn't really useful. And I don't really know if it's useful, but we did it. And that is trying to figure out what is land and what is water and uh, the difficulties. So it was a good exercise, but I don't know if anybody's actually used this particular data. So you can see trying to, to and, and, and this changed many, many times over the years um, because it was actually marshland and is now actual hard industrial land or former industrial land. So our data never thought they would be used by the public, and that's the really amazing thing, the eye-opener for me, is that sure it's used in, in academic uh, work, but it's mostly used by the public. The public, there's a huge demand for this, and so the Lost Rivers people conduct walks, uh, Jane's Walk uses our data. Um, this is something else, this is uh, again uh, demand for underground water. Um, and these are, uh, this is an interesting one, is artists that use our data. I never thought that artists would use the, these data sets, but they actually built an installation to show people where the dawn was, and not just online, but they actually built it on the ground to actually show people where the, the, where the, 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 the uh, river was. So we've put all these maps online. Again, um, with our, our historical maps as well, we've, we've seen a lot of artists um, using our maps and the City of Toronto's maps as well. Uh, this is a really fun one. The, a, a brewery in my neighborhood has actually used the fire insurance plant on its truck. Um, and interestingly, th this is a, a, a really important one in terms of libraries and how we approach our projects and how we approach our collections. I really learned a big lesson from this one. And that is, th this fellow here, 
decided that the way the public library and the University of Toronto were actually displaying their maps, first of all, he, in a lot of cases, he, the public wouldn't even know they existed. Um, even if they're searchable on Google, he, what he did was he actually took all these maps from the, our collections and put them on a site in a way that he thought made sense. Well, he made the news and became a huge celebrity because people thought, in, in local circles, a celebrity. Um, but he was actually on the national news because he figured out a way that people wanted their maps, to, they wanted to see their maps. It made total sense. I would never have thought of it that way because I'm a librarian and I, I, I'm somewhat jaded in some ways and I think people need to view information a certain way. So I learned a huge lesson from this one and that is not necessarily to, again, try and figure that out, figure out on my own, but to actually talk to people like him to actually say, what is it that you want? Because the public can really help us in building these. And so out of our maps being put on this aggregated site, you, you now see all sorts of articles in blog posts, in, in newspapers, that have our collections in them. And it's fantastic. And then we, that allows us to reuse some of that information as well. So some, these are some of the maps from, from, uh, from us and from the city that have been put into an actual um, online environment that we can actually recapture. And this is my online view of the Don Valley Historical Mapping Project now that I've put it in a web map. And I've actually incorporated some of the maps that this fellow actually aggregated. So it, it, it's a real va-et-vient. Um, va What's va et -vient? Do you know va et -vient? <laughs> It's a back and forth between the public and, the, uh, and us. Um, a few other projects similar to this that really, you know, I've taken some of her data to actually uh, um, help some of our classes, uh, some of the classes that are dealing with historical GIS. She's done an amazing job at, at mapping out uh, a specific part of the city of Toronto's history. And both of these people actually won awards for their work, and I think that's fantastic. Um, what else? So um, maybe I'll leave it at that. There is another project. I'll just give you a couple of slides of this. This is um, also a historical GIS project that I'm involved in that maps out or, or takes historical county maps, and there are some in the United States as well and other parts of the world, where they show um, names of occupants on the ground. So there are many, many of these maps for southern Ontario, and we've digitized them and are slowly building an actual database. So we've ge georeferenced these maps again, and this is what it sort of looks like. It's sp it, it does spread out further east as well now. And we built again a database like this. And so we got, we've got all these different names, and we've put these online. Well, this is the most amazing part is, this is the online view here. I just want to go to one slide, where I presented this at the Ontario Genealogical Society. Now, I know genealogical research can be really difficult to deal with sometimes. They're very lovely people, but you know, their, their lives, uh, their, their families are so interesting, aren't they? Um, and so here, here are uh, some of the things that you can do. This is just on, in the on online environment. Um, but this genealogical research, um, I, I get an email, I swear to God, almost every day about these maps because I put them online. And you can search these names on the maps. So uh, I get very funny requests, though, because they don't actually specify what they're emailing me about. There's no subject line most of the time. And they'll say, what's wrong with the map? Or where's Elgin? You know, very, very interesting. And it all says, uh, sent from my iPad. It, it's a very interesting thing. Anyway, so those are some of the projects that I'm involved in, and I think it's really important to think about the public uh, in terms of partners, but it also to think about, um, you know, how we how we use maps. We all have to be wise map users. We think we need to think critically and historically, and we need to think about what David Rumsey says, and that is that put things on the web for free, for God's sake. Good things will happen. We're public institutions, unless you're not part of a public institution, but in Canada that's pretty rare. Historically, GIS can help with answering in meaningful ways what was there. Um, and so, yes, involving the public, I think, is, is increasingly important. And with that, I'll end there.
Thank you very, very much, Marcel, for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. I always look at Marcel's presentations every time that I see one. I'm like, that's the true meaning of PowerPoint. <laughs> go, 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 go. That's power. Um, any questions or comments for Marcel's presentation? So this work is very similar to work that's being done at Emory University where we're digitizing maps that are in Emory's collection and the collection of Georgia State University, another uh, uh, college in Atlanta, and overlaying them onto OpenStreetMap and allowing you to change their opacity and overlay multiple maps on top of a map of Atlanta so you can see these uh, uh, the changes between historical maps and the current map. And this is the first time I've seen another project that's almost exactly the same as the type of work that's being done at Emory. So I wonder how, uh, if you've seen any other projects that are dedicated to digitizing maps of, historical maps of specific cities. Well, the, the New York Public Library Map Warper um, is dedicated to their entire collection. It, it, most of their fire insurance plans have now been put online and you can view that way. Um, that's definitely the, 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 the one to, the, the most important one. Are you, are you talking about a specific city? Um, yeah, well, my assumption is that it's easier to work with maps of cities than, say, maps of entire countries or other administrative divisions. Well, well I, I think that opens up an interesting part there, is that when you overlay, and, and this is increasingly, of course, the way people want to see information, is you overlay it on, on OpenStreetMap, or you overlay it on top of Google. The problem with that is, of course, you're dealing with one projection, and maps don't come in one projection. And so, yes, if you're looking at a large geographic area like a continent, and you put a map that's, that wasn't um, that wasn't projected in World Mercator, or Web Mercator, it's going to look very, very funny. And it's good that it looks funny because I think that makes people think, ah, what's going on here, you know? And I think that question of the Mercator question that, that I was talking about earlier, it needs to be in our minds. And that West Wing episode where they talk about the Mercator projection in a certain way, it's kind of made to be funny, but it's, it's, it's a real issue. Not necessarily for lack of acknowledgement that Africa is bigger, but that the entire world looks different in many different ways. And if you use just one projection, the world will look like just one projection. We'll think of that map as being warped, but that map isn't necessarily warped, right? But um, there, are, there are lots of projects out there. Again, the David Rumsey collection, uh, they want people to georeference images on there. Um, yeah, no, the, the, it's, this isn't, a, a, you know, revolutionary. We built this about 10 years ago now, and I get a lot of mileage out of it. I've got a lot of other projects that are on the go uh, that I could do presentations about, but mostly I want to talk about the impact, the importance of historical GIS. Yeah, there's no shortage of examples of this kind of stuff. But again, uh, in terms of libraries, though, libraries need to think about how they present this and what they do with it and what these mean as well. Hi, um, it's such an interesting um, project for, you know, um, the fire insurance plan um, and build database on that. Um, I'm wondering, like, whether uh, any historian uh, participated in this project? Yes, uh, at the time, uh, this particular one was done by myself and a PhD in history here at U of T. Uh, she's now a faculty member at York University. Um, and it, it, again, it was a very modest project in a lot of ways. It was very small, so we had students and the two of us. Um, the county map project is actually four librarians across the country. Um, but the, 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 the SHRC grant that I'm on right now, the federal government grant that I'm on, um, that one is, is mostly faculty. There are a lot of librarians on the, on the grant as well. There are about a total of 20 of us on the, on the grant. Um, and uh, there are a lot of geographers and historians. So th that's an interesting world as well, is working with geographers and, and uh, historians. Um, and, and, and it really, there is a big, big difference in how they do digital projects and how they approach data. My view in Canada is that geographers are more, uh, more 
in line with things have to be very accurate and precise. Historians are more interested in the story and how, it, it, how they can tell the story with the data. And uh, the, the sharing as well seems to be different. There, there's a difference between how you approach the sharing of data. Do you share it from day one or do you wait until the whole project is over? The social sciences versus the humanities is very different. But um, no, this, th these particular projects, uh, no faculty members are, are, are now involved. Any more questions, comments? Um, it's not a question, but it's a comment. And then um, I'm very, I was very intrigued uh, by the project you made, you did. But also, like, so I just wanted to mention that you want to share the information, like American Panorama. Uh, have you heard of University of Richmond professor uh, using a Stanford so American Panorama? They have also oh, yes, yes, yeah, yes, American yes. Panorama mm -hmm. is a straight trade, and then how trade was sold, and then which port, and then how trade trade migrated to the West. So it's visually histor historical maps, and then straight trades, and also redlining as you showed uh, mm -hmm. for the uh, uh, fire insurance. Mm -hmm. So the redlining. So civil. So you mentioned about civic engineering. So people in San Francisco, when I attended this uh, small talk, and the people talking about Black Lives Matter, and the people talking about redlining, mm -hmm. and then using historical maps, so it's relevant, and then the uh, historic uh, professor of history were also involved in American Panorama. So this mm -hmm. is very important, this is really engaging both just the social, uh, social science professors, and also data, and also civic engineering. So it's just a comment. Yeah, there was, in the, the book that we published on historical GIS in Canada, one of the interesting stories, the first chapter in it, was actually from um, University of Victoria, where they, they looked at where people actually lived in 19th century and early 20th century Victoria. And the, the thought had always been that, uh, that the, the, the Chinese were completely uh, segregated from the rest of the population. But what, what looking at uh, different uh, fire insurance plans, looking at censuses, they figured out that everybody was living everywhere. Uh, and that's revolutionary when you think of, of Chinatowns. Uh, uh, no, I don't, it, you, not necessarily that this means that it's the same thing everywhere, but I thought that was, it, it's sort of the same idea of where people live and where people work, and how you can uncover this by looking at it spatially, uh, and not just thinking about it spatially, but actually doing it in a map. Any more comments or questions? All right. Thank you very much, Marcel. Thank you.